Good evening, friends. Warmest welcome to our worship service tonight. Let's sing together Psalm 1, 1A. This is Sing Psalms, Psalm 1, 1A. This is page 1 in the Blue Books. We sing the whole of the first Psalm, 1A. Blessed is the one who turns away from where the wicked walk, who does not stand in sinners' paths or sit with those who mock. Instead, he finds God's holy law, his joy, and great delight. He makes the precepts of the Lord his study day and night. Let's sing this whole psalm, Psalm 1a, page 1. Blessed is the one who turns away from where the wicked walk. Blessed is the one who turns away from Let's all pray and seek God together. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, as we draw near to you this evening, as we come to sing these words of that first psalm, that we may be able to uh, weigh ourselves and examine and evaluate ourselves in light of what we've just been singing and how the distinction, the, the difference between all mankind, although there's many things to differentiate all of us, even here in this meeting, there is but one real difference in man, among mankind, and you've shown it there in that psalm. There are those who walk in your ways, who love your word and keep it, and there are others who choose to, like all of us once did, all we like sheep. We have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way, turning away from what we know to be revealed to us in your word. But we thank you for the power that makes the change, the Holy Spirit changing people like us to turn us around and to change the way we think, change the way we feel and the way we live. And so we would be converted people who have gone through a change that's more obvious to, 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 in some people's experience than it is in, in other people's. But the change nonetheless, and that when we try to reduce that change, not to reduce it in the sense of minimize, but when we try and understand what's at the very center of it, 
of what it is to have this new change. We read there in that psalm when we sing together about the centrality and the importance of Scripture in such a life, that your word is not an optional extra, but that it is an essential requirement for spiritual growth and development. You've said it to us so clearly in the parables. We look at one of them tonight, and there are so many others that will highlight the fact of like in John 15, the fact of you are the, the, the vine and your people are the branches and their dependence uh, upon you and their deriving strength and energy from you comes through the channel of your word and your words abiding in your people, they will then bear much fruit. And we're conscious, Lord, as we come to you tonight that we are in that dependence upon you, dependence for the blessing to come to us and uh, it's in that parable you make it very clear you say it and we so often when we pray together and we, we hear people saying it and we say it ourselves but without you we can do nothing and that nothing means absolutely nothing of any good anything beneficial in your service but with your help and with your assistance david said in psalm 18 by my god assisting me i can overleap a wall so for that help that we would be looking into our own hearts and not looking too much to get too discouraged, but like one of your servants said many years ago, to take a look at self and a hundred at your son, that seeing ourselves would be enough to, to chase us, as it were, out of, our, out of relying or depending on self in any way and to not be despairing over what we maybe find about ourselves, but to be rejoicing that you have made the provision for people who've made a mess and whose lives are broken lives spiritually, though someone might seem the most together person on the face of the earth. Like Saul of Tarshish, but he said, when the commandment came, sin came alive. He goes as far as saying, and I died. And he discovered that the life, that the, the word, the law that was intended to give life or that he thought he would attain life through keeping he discovered to be what he says a means of death. Not that that was intentional in the sense that um, it, it wasn't meant to be an end in itself, but a means to an end. That you have provided and you gave your law to show us our utter inadequacy and imperfection. And at the same time to highlight your perfection. That that moral law is a perfect revelation of your character that you are the one who embodies all moral perfection and revealing to us in your laws the Ten Commandments we think of. We see there so much in life that we fail in and how it affects not only what is said or done but also what is thought and intended, how it involves the mind and the feelings, the imagination and so much. And David said in Psalm 119 that your commandment is exceedingly broad. Like you show us in the Sermon on the Mount, there's a depth, there's a breadth, there's a height, there's a length to the coverage and the implication of your word and commands. And how the Jewish people there they, around you, they thought, because they hadn't murdered anyone, that they weren't murderers, but you showed them that it's about a murderous attitude, a hateful spirit, and seeking revenge and uh, seeking the expression and, and, the, and, and to give vent to frustration that you say that if we say to someone that you fool, that we'll be in danger of the fire of hell. Not that, that the word itself is something, but what we mean by it and how we're saying it. Lord, we know to our shame of giving expression and saying things in anger and frustration. And we know how it feels when uh, not, not only the bad feeling of wishing we never said it, but realizing that we did, realizing that it's in us and realizing that potential is still very much there in every one of us. But Lord, our God, help us as we come to you tonight, that we may come to your feet and bow before you and realize the provision that you have made for us to provide a reconciliation that covers everything that is outstanding and necessary so that we can come to you as a result and believe in you and accept you and all that you've done for us so that we don't contribute or bring 
or give anything, but that we are to freely and receive from you. And in that way, we come as those who are, who are poor and needy and have nothing. And so, Lord, it's from the riches, it's the riches of your word we seek to, to benefit from tonight. It's from these unsearchable riches. It's into these we seek to go and that you would reveal to us the truth of Scripture that we consider tonight and that it would be your word to us, as it is anyway, but for us to know that wonderful truth of what is uh, your word as a word that is given to us, a word that is communicated to us so personally, so directly. And Lord, for the Holy Spirit to, as it were, breathe life into these words he's given so that they would come into our own minds and understandings and uh, change us in our will, that part where we decide, but also for the word to live and abide in us as well. Remember our gathering, Lord, those who are not able to be here with us tonight. We pray for them, Lord, for those who are unwell, those who are downcast, those who are weak, those who are caring for others. We pray for them, Lord, and all who are in need in any way that you would grant that rescue and deliverance to all who are in need and that you will answer the prayers that ascend and that, that go up to you constantly where people maybe feel that they're not being heard or maybe have a feeling of so little self-worth that might reflect itself into their own attitude about their own prayers. But you've told us that we're not to be like the, the heathen who talk a lot in the sense of they think they'll be heard for saying so much when they pray to you. But Lord, to have that proper childlike and that humble spirit to be praying in the name of Jesus, you've said. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Lord, there is a relief and release from all self-reliance, even in prayer. It isn't, though it, our faith will be involved, it isn't because of our faith that your answer comes every time or in every instance sometimes like the prophet said before they call i will answer and sometimes lord you provide and and deliver and whatever it might be in in the moment when we've maybe thought about it but haven't put it into words or made the request but we thank you that as you've shown us that we are to ask what we ask in the name of jesus it is his perfection his adequacy and his accomplishment in life and death. And that's what gives us the confidence to come to you. It gives us the boldness to pray and take your name on our lips. To have even the daring like Abraham felt himself having praying for Sodom and Gomorrah because of his, lef his nephew Lot. He was still in the city that the cities you were going to destroy. And he wrestles with you, but he says, oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I'll ask this once more. And, and he says to him, so me who am dust and ashes, the thought, as we'd say, the thought of him speaking to God, it affects us too and we think of it and we can truly marvel sometimes at even listening to ourselves when we know that there was a time we never prayed or thought we did but didn't and that amazing change that takes place where it isn't only these offering of petitions or requests or even that thanksgiving but there is that way where we can come and meet with you. And like was said of, um, to Ananias, when you change Saul of Tarshish, and, and Ananias didn't want to go and see him. He uh, didn't, well, it doesn't say as much, but it would seem that, that he was so weary and concerned for his own safety. But then you said to him, behold, he's praying. And the fact of Saul of Tarshish having become a praying man was all Ananias needed to believe that his heart had been changed and that he was now walking on that path that we've been singing about in Psalm 1. And so, Lord, may we all be on that path, lead us into it, the, follow, the, 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 the paths of righteousness, walking in the ways of God. May your word be blessed here and everywhere it's read and be with the youth fellowship meeting afterwards, all who are engaged in and, and, and preparing for and being part of this work. And you'll bless the gathering. And blessing, Lord, upon the Sunday school, upon the teachers, parents, families, everyone who was out this morning, and for the children learning that you take care of them in the holidays too. And bless them, Lord, those moving on in different classes, 
moving on in life. Grant openings, Lord, and protection, and that you will guide all of their steps. Remember all who need you tonight. We're praying for healing, the raising up of the downcast, and, Lord, the peace of mind and heart to troubled and distressed, the anxious, the worrying, those who maybe feel beside themselves day or night, sometimes both, but that you would help them to cast their burdens upon you and to find that it's in casting them upon you where to let go of them. And we, we try to keep it, even part of it, to ourselves. That we don't realize maybe what we're doing. But rather than relinquishing and, and by faith rolling, as it were, the burdens upon you, where you tell us to do this, we maybe sometimes keep part of it to ourselves. Not that we mean to, try to, hope to, or even want to. But it's just how it sometimes is. But for that faith, and for that trust and for that obedience that we yield ourselves to you and all our situations tonight. So that for the few moments we meet round scripture tonight, that you will bless the words to us and that they will speak and maybe rearrange even our thoughts and priorities and maybe the problems we had in our minds coming in, whatever it might be, that your word will have that place to put everything right in our thinking and in our believing. Remember each one of the churches around us, throughout our islands and throughout the whole world. Remember, Lord, our generation come to us in power and blessing. Revive your work. Establish your kingdom. Further your cause and purpose. And may the kingdom come. Lord, that we would share the cry of the church, the end of Revelation, where the Spirit and the bride are saying, come, the church and the Spirit are giving expression to their desire, longing for the second coming and for the kingdom to come with the coming of the great king himself. Lord our God, hear us. Meet us tonight and do us good, we pray. We deserve nothing and we know it, but we come in Jesus' great name, your son, our Lord. He is our confidence and he is our hope. He is our peace. He is everything. He has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, just as sanctification and redemption. Your people are complete in him. And so that we would rejoice in that fact, no matter what's happening, or even no matter how we might feel, that we may, like the Peter, James, and John, the Mount of Transfiguration, that they saw no man afterwards, but only Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen. Let's continue singing. We'll turn to Psalm 19, 1, 9. This is Scottish Psalter 19, and it's page 223, 223, Psalm 19. We're going to sing from the beginning down to verse 8. So God's revelation in the skies above us in creation, but also, <laughs> verse 7, God's revelation in his word that actually changes people's hearts. Psalm 19, the heavens, God's glory do declare, the skies his handworks preach, Day utter speech, to day and night to night, doth knowledge teach. There is no speech nor tongue to which their voice doth not extend. Their line is gone through all the earth, their words to the world's end. We're going to sing verses 1 to 8, Psalm 19, the heavens, God's glory do declare. The heavens, God's glory do declare. The skies his hands reach, day after speech to day and night, to night of knowledge seeks. There is no speech or tongue to wish, their voice does not 
read together in the Gospel according to Matthew this evening, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew and 13. Let's read the whole chapter together. Matthew 13, verse 1. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. But he told them many things in parables, saying, A sore went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. But the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown... It is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in his branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. 
He answered them, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you uh, you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? They took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So on. May God bless that section of his word to us. Let's turn now, shall we, to Psalm 119, 119, Scottish Psalter 119, and it's at verse 89, page 407, 407. This is Psalm 119 from verse 89. Thy word forever is, O Lord, in heaven, settled fast unto all generations. Thy faithfulness doth last. The earth thou hast established, and it abides by thee. This day they stand as thou ordains for all thy servants be. Psalm 119, this is from verse 89 down to 96. Thy word forever is, O Lord.
Let's turn back to our reading in Matthew, Matthew 13. And let's read again verses 16 and 17. We read in verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Our Lord is saying these amazing words as, a, as an explanation or an answer to the question that the disciples are putting to him. They're trying to understand why he's speaking in parables. Now, I remember somebody using um, or, or saying in conversation that, uh, that the parables were themselves being themselves suited for the time in which they were given. So speaking in parables back in our Lord's time, someone would argue the argument goes would be quite a, a regular way of talking and illustrating things. And someone was saying the, the principle of that, I, I don't, agree, don't agree with this, but um, we'll see in just a minute why. They were from that saying that forms of dramatizing or even drama shows with gospel stories would be a modern day equivalent. Now, that's not to talk about shows and all that, that's another issue. But the principle is some people think that the parables were given by Jesus in order to make the truth easier to understand. I don't know if you think, or, or I think like that. The way truth is illustrated, biblical truth, the concepts, the ideas in God's revelation in scripture, some of them, most of them can be very, very hard to understand. There's an impossibility about understanding some of the things of um, some of the things about the Bible. We're actually seeing, in fact, what we're reading there about those who, who uh, when the Lord is explaining, they receive the word with the, the right attitude. Verse 23, that's what was sown in the good soil. This is the one, here it is, who hears the word and understands it. And understands it. It makes sense. The penny drops. It falls into place. Maybe over time. It doesn't need to be on one occasion someone hears it. But for most of us, or certainly all of us, for most of us, um, but there's a sense you may re remember this in your own life. Some it was maybe harder to see. But for most of us, it was that the Bible seemed to be very much a closed book. There was something we just couldn't quite get. What, what was that? What's the actual point of this? What's the missing part in my understanding about the message of the Bible. You know what it really is? It's the cross, the centrality of the death of Jesus. Because when we don't have an understanding of our own need to be forgiven and saved, then we won't appreciate or really see or understand the need of a Savior. The kingdom means nothing. This is where the Jews had failed, largely the Pharisees and uh, the scribes, all of these people, they thought they were good enough. By keeping what God said and complying with his commands, they think, well, this is all we need. But they were so wrong, weren't they? And a big part of the situation that they were facing is that they, they couldn't see when the light was shining right at them. They couldn't see it. It was their blindness. They had the, they had the company of the Son of God, Son of Man. They had his presence. They had his teaching. They had his ministry of healing. He was accessible. He was approachable. He was God manifested in the flesh. And all of these and many, many other uh, truths about what his uh, being among the people was only highlight the fact and, and aggravate even the fact of our spiritual blindness. The verses we read, uh, 16 and 17, aren't referring to, to that. The, the blessing that the Lord pronounces on the eyes of the disciples is they're living to see the fulfillment of the prophecies of the coming of Christ. The kings uh, and the righteous people and the prophets, they many, many of them were 12 verse 17, desired to see, longed in fact to see what you see and didn't see it. It's not that they couldn't see it because they were spiritually blind, but that they were historically separated from the fulfillment. So there was something of dreams, longings, aspirations that the prophets had for the coming of Christ. They were longing for this. 
and waiting for that day. In fact, if you read, I think it's 1 Peter 1, and towards the end of the chapter, Peter says something fascinating. But sometimes he says the prophets, paraphrasing this, I can't remember the words exactly, either, but, but in paraphrasing he speaks about that the, the prophets themselves searched diligently, they inquired diligently into the, the, the subject matter of their own prophecies, who the prophecies were talking about and when exactly the prophecies would be fulfilled. I mean, if you want to have a, a look at what Peter's saying about that, it's fascinating. Because we might think ordinarily the prophets had this insight to or what they were receiving through inspiration from God, but that clearly isn't the case. I think that's what Peter's saying. Not that they maybe didn't have a, a, an understanding at all, that they were clueless. It's not that so much as they were trying to peer into the significance as far as they tried to grasp hold of the content of what they were saying. And it's in that sense, I think, the Lord is saying to his disciples, your eyes are blessed because you're living, basically you're living in the age and the time of fulfillment that the prophets, the kings, and the righteous people longed to see. So we think about this question that, that, that uh, the Lord is, uh, well, it's, it's, not so, it's, it's not so much a question. It's a question the disciples have. What the Lord is giving is the answer and the explanation. It's a very, 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 very solemn explanation the Lord gives. Now, we said it recently. We're thinking of it recently, how uh, uncomfortable it could be in the company of prophets. Be very uncomfortable. And it's, you know, in the sense where Herod, we saw Herod and John the Baptist and our Lord in front of that same, the same Herod. And Herod expected the Lord to do a sign in front of him, to entertain him somewhat. And he was met with silence. Looking for the wrong reasons, looking for the wrong thing altogether in, in looking for Jesus. Like the disciples, there were many of them, were told in the early chapters of John's Gospel, and they followed even across the Sea of Galilee to get to where he was. And the Lord says to them, you followed me not because of the sign. You're seeking me not because of the sign, but because you ate bread and were filled. Looking for him for all the wrong reasons. And getting things so uh, confused and getting things on their, their heads. We're saying that just it's by way of introduction. Why do, why do you speak in parables? And the Lord is saying so that they won't understand what I'm saying. So that isn't what uh, someone was trying with the best intention and motivation possible to say by saying the parables give us a justification for using certain methods in gospel proclamation. Making the message as simple as possible is one thing. Uh, one thing, in fact, it was Matthew Henry, the commentator, he spoke about that if, if we think of the, the, the gospel, the word of God as if you think of it as an arrow, we mustn't fire it over anyone's head. You mustn't fire it under anyone's feet. It, it mustn't be like way over our heads, and it mustn't be oversimplified and watered down that it's insubstantial. But no, fire not over the head or, or, or at the feet, but at the heart. And that, I think, is what the Lord is saying to us. And this is the question we've got to ask ourselves as those who receive the word in the right way. Receive it, we're told with understanding. It makes sense. The penny drops. Let's look at this parable, shall we? We were told in verse 1 that Jesus was so surrounded by the crowds that he had to go into a boat, push away from the shore somewhat, and the crowd are there standing, standing on the beach. This 13th chapter is dealing with kingdom parables. The Lord is exp excuse me, exp explaining what the kingdom is like and really showing that there's a mixture of people in the kingdom. There are people who are actually God's people, and there are people who are not. Those who are saved and those who are not. He's not talking about what we'd maybe say is the church and the world. He's talking about the church, the, 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 the visible, the organizational expression of God's people. The church, the ecclesia, the called out and the called together. That's really what the church means, the two words, it's, uh, it's called out. And Christians are the called out, the called together, the summoned by God himself. What a wonderful thing it is. And Paul says on one occasion that in introducing his words to the church, he calls one of the churches those who have been called into the fellowship of God's Son. What an amazing reality that is. 
Called to have her sins forgiven, yes. Called to a new life, a new spiritual life, and a new future, and an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, and doesn't fade away. Absolutely. But think about it. What does it really mean for you? All of these things are part of this. But what does it really mean for you to, at the thought of being a Christian, of, of someone who, who, who has been um, changed and someone who has been called? Well, the glory of it is really being called into the fellowship of God's Son, that he becomes someone that you know, someone that you talk to, someone who talks to you, someone whose presence you're aware of, someone who is as real to you sometimes as though you were standing there in Matthew 13 and looking at him and hearing him. And almost if you were to put out your hand, you feel you would touch him. Called into the fellowship of his Son. Oh, many people thought that the kingdom was all about me keeping the, the king's laws and complying with his requirements and having a massive role and sphere of influence in the kingdom. In fact, you remember when James and John wanted to be our lords, not his right-hand men, but one on either side, and, and their mother also was encouraged, trying to encourage and persuade Jesus to give them this honor. The Lord said to James and John, I forgot to mention that in the, this in the morning, but the Lord on one occasion said to them, are you able to drink the cup that I'll drink or be baptized with the baptism that I'll be baptized with. And they said, we're able to. They didn't know what they were saying because they didn't understand what he was meaning. He was saying, are you, able, are you going to suffer like me? You, you want to have and share in and participate in my crown. Are you ready to suffer in the process? Are you ready to suffer before and, and to go through trials and tribulations in order for you to share like, I have to suffer the cross, and then I'll receive the crown. And they said, of course we're ready. They didn't realize the cross. They didn't realize at that point his death. They thought that being part of the kingdom just meant you're a Jewish man, Jewish woman. You're in. You belong to God. He loves you. And it's just a matter of time. So long as you keep the commandments, do the best you can. It's only a matter of time before the Messiah comes and comes bringing power and bringing glory to earth. And it must have been so, it must have been so um, overwhelming, to say the least, for the disciples to have to come to terms that, with the fact that they had completely misunderstood what the Old Testament said the Messiah would be like when he came. They completely misunderstood. It's only as the Lord was opening their hearts, is it not, and opening their eyes and using his servants around them. Remember John the Baptist? Pointing his disciple, John was baptizing people with a view to repentance, with preparing for the, the coming of the Lord. They were getting ready, turning their hearts to the Lord to be ready for the Messiah coming. And John had disciples with him. But John was pointing his disciples to Jesus, John 1, the, the apostle John, not John the Baptist, of course, writing that gospel. But John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. And these are standalone glorious words. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But John was saying that as Jesus walked past. And his disciples heard him say it and they followed Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is something that people with the Jewish heritage and background and, and, and all the interpretations down the century, misinterpretations down through the centuries had led them to believe. It must have been such a revolutionary thing in their thinking and in their hearts to realize that they'd been wrong. What a joy it is to realize you've been wrong about something. Does it, it, it not, not, in, well, that, that's a very, very uh, broad statement, but not meaning everything in life, of course. Sometimes you realize we're wrong and, and that can be a catastrophic situation because of wrong decisions and so on. Don't mean that. But in terms of spiritually, when the Lord corrects you or, ch or changes things in your thinking and mind, Jesus, do you remember, and, and this I think proves the, the, the point of, 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 of this, is where he took a little child and he took the child in front of them and he said that this is how we have to be in order to receive the kingdom. The child is trusting. The child is, is uh, not in, in insisting in, in that instance. It's, it's dependent. It's trusting. It's not coming with his own ideas. Not coming to, you know, but just coming to learn and to listen. To have a teachableness. To have a humility, a submissiveness. These and many other things. Now, when we come in with, 
you know, prove this to me, or God going to do this, or are you going to do that, almost bargaining. We have to come. James says, our Lord's half-brother. He wrote the letter of James, Mary and Joseph's son. He wrote, did he not, on, on, on one occasion, among other things, he's talking about the fact that we can, we can pray and we can, we can be asking for the wrong thing. We can be looking uh, for the, even the right thing the wrong way. You ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss, he says, because it's a self-centered thing. We're looking for it, ultimately, for ourselves. But he says this, what a thought. He tells us that we are to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. If we come to the Bible and we've got our, our arrogant defiance and our hard-heartedness, then let's not, ex well, let's not expect the Lord to speak to us or bless us. That doesn't mean he won't. You know, the, you sometimes do you ever wonder what, what the Lord must, I mean, and this is in a positive way and in a, in a kind of humorous way, because when you think of it for yourself as a Christian, you maybe heard of, of someone, you can think of people maybe, it might have been yourself, I don't know, who were really stubborn under the gospel, really stubborn. And you were insisting that whoever was going to be changed wasn't going to be you. And um, there you are. I remember someone, a man who used to, uh, well, he was, well, a character in his own way, everyone is, but this man used to, have, used to even go about the town, he'd have a, a, an animal on his shoulder sometimes, and um, he said by himself, he'd said on one occasion, he'd heard the gospel, and saying, God, well, said, I'll never bow my knee before God, I'll never bow my knee. That man became such a bright Christian, and you know, to hear him pray in prayer meetings was a delight. Someone who clearly knew the Lord, and was only glad, only glad to bow his knee before Jesus. The stubbornness was gone. God takes that away. It's not a fight. It's not a struggle. It's easy. But we're trying to say, what, what does the Lord think about us when we do that? How do you think? You find it not, not, not in a, not, you know, when you say you find it funny or humorous. It's not in, in any way in a derogatory or a mocking way. It's with such affection and such love and, you know, someone thinking. Like, like Pete, we read in the morning about Pete, Peter in, in Acts the end, of, the end of chapter 11, where, where Peter was saying, well, who, who am I that I should be fighting against God? You know, the principle of God moving among the Gentiles. Peter's saying, I've got to go with it. Whatever I maybe think historically as a Jew or whatever our practices ceremonially were, God is changing this. So I've got to go along with it. But sometimes, you know, people might resist and and um, try this or try that and think they're succeeding when God is on their path. God is pursuing them. You know, how does he feel? You wonder, is there a gladness? Is, I don't know. It's just a thought. It's such a wonderful thing to see a resistant and a stubborn heart being changed by the power of God's grace. Doesn't, doesn't, he doesn't, he isn't weakened through the process. He, he, in exerting and showing his power, he isn't in any way reduced in his resources. God doesn't have trouble with anyone. People who fight and they, they kick and scream, no problem with the Lord. He changes our hearts. He changes us so amazingly that we, we listen. We're teachable. I think that's one of the principles there behind it. Where the Lord is saying in verse 9, he who has ears. Let him hear. He's saying, does this make sense to you? Well, there's four groups here. We're just going to touch on them to think of them and, and, and note the Lord's explanation. Some people hear that when they're, when they're, whether it's in church, whatever, well, where the, the Lord is teaching. And while he's teaching, there's people listening. He's on the boat just away from the shore, there on the beach, and they're all standing. Uh, and he's, he's sitting in the boat the way the teacher would, would take their seat. And he's explaining there's a category of people who hear the word and it has no effect on them whatsoever. It doesn't maybe even seem to engage their thinking. We can remember that. And uh, there is that ability. You know, and we mustn't gauge the power and effect in the gospel by this. There is an ability with us, the Lord leaving us. And we can allow the word to go in one ear and out the other. People might say, well, not a very powerful message, this Bible, is it? You know, there was a great theologian in, in regard to this kind of thing in the 1800s, William Shedd. Um, 
one of his books, he's got a number of books, but one of, one of them, it's Calvinism Pure and Mixed. But in that book, he talks about, there was a controversy in that, there always has been, but should they have changed certain uh, section? If you w get the book, it's a good read uh, on, on this subject. But there was a, a drive, there was a shift, there was an intention back when he was alive and teaching to change parts of the Westminster Confession of Faith to make them more inclusive and, and to make them more like gospel-centered and not to be so restrictive. That was the idea. That doesn't need to be changed. This man's book is showing that these statements are as full of gospel invitation in the confession as anything that's been suggested or being proposed. So that was the context of the book. But in it, he talks about something. I'm not sure about the way he says it, but we know exactly what he's saying. Talking about common grace. And by that common, it's not being reduced to be lesser than, than special, but by common, it means general. Romans 1, if you have a look in Romans 1, it's a picture of God taking away restraint from a society. And then all homosexual practices and all distortions of God's creation. Notice what's happening, if you would ever read in Romans 1. It's a distortion of creation and God's intention for mankind. It's satanic. And it blurs the distinctions that God has made within his creation. So people, one example, it's not just men with men and women with women. As the Bible says, doing what is inconvenient, doing what's not right. It's a sign of divine abandonment of a people. When this thing breaks out and the, the darkness, people not realizing how devilish this whole thing is. How it is an indication of God taking his hand away from a society and allowing people to do what they want. And Satan being in there in the darkness, distorting creation. This is what he wants, to distort it. To turn it all the wrong way, to turn it on its head. But let's let's ask ourselves when we when we consider this, God's hand, you know, you even see it in a life. A life that used to be kind of confined, and then you maybe see that life just go completely off the rails. It doesn't mean abandonment, but certainly to see the hand of the Lord withdrawing from that life, from that society, and evil breaking out as it does. It's into this whole situation of fallenness and lostness and being unteachable and being insistent on our own way that God sends the gospel. He brings his word to us and it seems such a powerless thing. It seems it. And people can sit in church year after year and not be bothered by it. Maybe not be bothered by it and, uh, you, you know, I don't know, can you remember that? Hopefully it's not the way you're feeling, but you, you just kind of feel, well, you know, I've got to do this, put up with it. But it's not having any real effect on me. Sometimes that's because it's nothing short of the fact that you're in the category of having the word stolen before it has any effect on your life. And it's stolen, notice, by Satan. The explanation is given. The evil one, verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path and we can maybe remember that your mind's a million miles away this this happens to god's people it happens it happens to any, anyone uh, and, and sometimes it's often when you're trying to worship that that the distractions will come and i think it's distractions and distortions because satan prevents people from understanding it's not that oh yes this is the thing i forgot what i was going to say a minute ago i just remembered it about um what shed was saying about common grace and he was referring in, in one of his books to this kind of thing people do not understand and in order to understand we need God's blessing so then the challenge is are we greater than God and being able to resist his blessing and what Shed was talking about was using this word these words defeating common grace the word defeat is well, it's it's right and it's true but it's is it accurate not splitting hairs can we ever say we ever defeat God in anything? It's not the same as saying that God leaves us when we choose to insist on our own path. We can never defeat. We can never overcome. Even Jacob wrestling with the angel, did he actually defeat the angel? He was permitted the power to prevail in that moment. And God may at times allow himself to be prevailed upon like in Isaiah 64 the prophet laments there's no one who stirs themselves up 
and lays hold of you, praying, wrestling with God. And uh, unlike Hezekiah praying, it seems God changed it. That's how it looks. That, that, that God changed his mind and his plan. He didn't, but that's how it looks. And from our perspective, it's how it seems. And God maybe wishes it to be for us that he answers prayer. Sometimes the opposite of what we expect is going to take place. Do we know what it is to have no understanding of the gospel at all? Or that when we're trying to listen to it, it's gone. And we go out of God's house, we go into a new week, and we don't remember anything. That can happen. But the people, the two categories there, where the seed has fallen, falls on the, the rocky ground. There isn't enough soil. And that's obviously going to have its own effect. When it's on the rocky ground, we're told that it's when tribulation or persecution comes on account of the word. Immediately, that's one of, of Mark's favorite words, but Matthew using immediately is very significant. Immediately upon suffering because of the word, he says, they fall away, immediately fall away. But notice in verse 20, the difference. These people hear the word and immediately receive it with joy. They can only receive with joy something they understand. The first group are people who hear the word and don't understand it. Satan's blinding the minds of those who don't believe, distracting us with this, with that, so we leave church. And it's almost as though we were in a dream when we were in church. But I had that experience. And you, you, go, you come back to yourself and you're thinking, sometimes you just want to go away and you're physically here, but your imagination can be a million miles away. It's other people and they hear the word and it gets their attention and it gets their emotions. And they receive, the, we're told, not amazing, they immediately verse 20 says receive the word with joy immediately maybe this is the problem not always but there's a really sharp a really sudden a really quick reaction and as soon as they hear it doesn't mean there shouldn't be a quick reaction but you ever come across a situation where you know the best thing for yourself or for anyone is to give it time god's work doesn't mean sudden conversions don't take place of course they do i think jonathan edwards has a, has a book talking about revival in america by the, back in the 1700s i think he's one of them it's a narrative of surprising conversions conversions can be surprising given who is converted surprising in terms of how the conversion happens but time always proves god's work doesn't it immediately they receive it with joy and immediately they fall away when trouble or persecution comes because of the word. Because of your identification with Jesus, life gets tough. People reject you. It affects your family. It affects your relationships. For some people, back then it certainly would have, where there was no church. Jesus was despised. The, the Christian uh, way of faith was looked down upon. And it was outlawed by the Roman government. It at, at, at came to that point. It was a revolutionary movement. So, I mean, you were in... In, on, the, on the losing side, it seemed, in society and in work and all of these things. And, you know, it's not to be cri critical of people. Some of the greatest of God's people have, have failed and, and yielded to the pressure of temptation in times where they may be being pressed and even tortured, interrogated, or even pressurized at school or at home, whatever it is. And it doesn't need to be verbally, but it can be practically denying him. You know, that maybe we've been in that position. This isn't the same thing. It's not the same thing to have a lapse. It's not something to, as it were, trip up and fall. Or even if that tripping up and falling happened a number of times, it's like in Psalm 1. It's where the course of life is overall governed by what is either right or what is wrong. Are you, which direction are we trying to live in? It isn't really an emotional experience that we have when we hear the message of the Bible. We're always wanting, praying, looking for response for all of us. But to receive the word with joy being as it is such a wonderful thing, it isn't itself proof of a conversion. That, that's, I think, what the Lord is saying. And, and well, how, how does he say this in what, in what terms? Well, when suffering comes, he isn't saying that Christians won't make a met. Peter denied three times he knew Jesus. It's not to say that won't happen, but Peter isn't, isn't living as a liar. Lying isn't his life. Deceitfulness, being sneaky and underhanded, that's not what he's doing. So if Peter falls into a sin, 
Yes, that we'll always think about and, and associate Peter with, but it must never color our view of him. It'll make us love him more because in many ways we can follow him. I think this is where people decide, no way, I'm turning my back. They throw in the towel and saying, I'm not carrying on with this. This suffering is too much. So the experience of receiving the word with joy wasn't an experience that led to a change of their hearts. You know how the Lord, um, throughout the Bible, he shows times and places and people where they heard his voice. You know, like on the last day, he, he gives the, a, a different, he said, many are going to say in that day, Lord, Lord. He said, we did many mighty works in your name. And he's going to say to them, I never knew you. Now that's that, that's like incalculably huge, that concept. How can someone do a miracle, a mighty work in the name of Jesus and not be a Christian? Well, how could King Saul in the Old Testament prophesy and come under the prophesying power of the Holy Spirit? He did, and that's it. How? We're not told. It's a very mysterious thing. Even in the Christian's life, the role of spirits upon the mind, upon the heart. Peter was the victim, unwilling and un unwitting victim of Satan's suggestions that Jesus shouldn't go to. This will never happen to you, he said. The Lord said, get behind me, Satan. I mean, we don't sometimes know the difference between what we're wh where our feelings are coming from or where our thoughts are coming from. But Peter knew what that was and, and went through these things. And the question, what we're trying to see is, in life, with its experiences, with its difficulties, no one lives in this vacuum where there's no trouble or problems or suffering or sickness. There's not, but the test comes in these moments in life. What do, you, what do you and I have when persecution or trouble comes because of the word, where we're rejected or viewed differently or neglected, whatever it might be, because of the Bible? doesn't make us want to throw the whole thing away and say, well, my comfort in this moment is far more important. Now, let's not minimize in any shape or form the suffering that people can go through, the, the, the difficulties. And it doesn't need to have a finger lifted, but verbally, even silence don't even need to say a word. Don't need to lift a finger to make someone suffer. The silence, the rejection, the isolation. All because you're a Christian. And people will either say, I can't put up with any more of this. Or they'll, or they'll say, I'm going to follow the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But the trouble can make people throw it in. And again, this, 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 some of this, the seeds are falling, falling among the thorns, we're told. And uh, the thorns grew up and choked the seed. And the Lord's explaining the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. They choke the word and it proves unfruitful. See, there are options. I mean, what, it doesn't mean, it isn't meaning that Christians and God's people will not be in a position where they may be very wealthy and may be very secure. Like, it's not saying that at all. We know of, in, in Acts, where in a Barnabas, people could, people having, Abraham and, and Job and the Old Testament, the New Testament, Barnabas, we read, him, read of him earlier on in, in Acts in the, in the morning. He's, he, he gave, so land brought the proceeds. So it isn't, it's not that the Lord is saying that Christians should be in this position that, that, that when the cares of the world or the thoughts of riches come in, that that's an immediately a bad thing and it shouldn't be there. The, thing, the, problem, the problem is often our ability or otherwise to cope with whatever it is God gives. And sometimes not having whatever that thing or situation or place or whatever it is might be as a result of, of the Lord knowing just what could happen if he gave it to us or he, that person or whatever it might be. We may not be ready for the blessings, but the blessings may come, whatever they might be. The problem, however, is people who, again, receive this message with such gladness and with such joy and enthusiasm. But then when suffering comes, the first group there, the second group, they throw the towel in. But when the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, see, these, these temptations come along and they meet 
people who are, who, who've, who've been, been maybe going to church and listening and it's having, having an effect on them, you put it like that. It's about going through the whole thing and being sensitive to the fact of temptation and to realize not that this is maybe something we could minimize or but to realize if, if you're someone going through the process, even in, as Christians, although this isn't addressing Christians, but people who are hearing the word at first, and their the first reaction, the first group, they don't hear anything. Second group, it's different. They're joyful. Third group, they're joyful. And this third group where the, the, the seed we're told is choked, it's, a, it's, it's not the things being in the person's life so much as allowing the things to get a hold in our life. You see the point of what's going on there. You can be an Abraham and a Job. You can, you can be the great people and it not bother you, not go to your head. Or, you know, it, it, unlike Hezekiah, it went to his head and he showed the Babylonians all his riches. After God had given him 15 more years, he showed them everything. Look at all my belongings. Saying, Hezekiah, they're not going to care about what you've got. Why are you showing this? Why is this all on show anyway? It's, it's not anything to do with the Babylonians, it's to do with Hezekiah's poor heart. As a man coming to the end of his life, who's gone through so much for God, and there it is. But the thing is, where is the word in our lives? And we're finishing to think about the prevailing power of the gospel in a person's life. It isn't a short-lived thing. You don't jump on the bandwagon. And, you know, there can be times, there have been situations where, where there'd be a, maybe a moving of God, and you'll often find people jumping in, or among young people, middle-aged old people, or all together. And there can be, people can become very sensitive to and become moved by the message. That's always to be treated with, um, not, not caution, but with hesitation. Hesitation in the sense that the Lord is telling us there are three categories of hearers of the gospel. And three, these three categories are describing responses that all lead to them not being saved. There's only one category of people who are saved, the people who are described as the, the good soil, ready to receive it. And when they receive it, there is the harvest. The fruit yields, in one case, a hundredfold, another 60, and another 30. And that takes time, doesn't it? The harvest isn't overnight. It's where things come along and we stick in there, we hang in there, we, we're like in Psalm 1. We're like the, the one who's, who's meditating on God's law day and night. Some people think, who wants to read that book all the time? What do you get out of it anyway? What is this Bible, this old book? It's so unscientific. It's so out of date, they say, and it's full of uh, contradictory morals. Then the Old Testament, the way you deal with... And it, it's, it's not like that at all. It's, it's very much exactly, not very much, it's exactly what Peter said when on that occasion... Uh, Jesus rebuked the crowds for uh, following him because of the bread and not because of what the sign pointed towards, meaning his own identity. But when he was talking about the fact that they came to, to get some bread and, and not for him, he said, I am the bread of life. And then they thought he was talking about cannibalism. How can we eat this man's flesh and drink this man's blood? And many, we're told, went away from him. They were professing faith. They're called disciples. Please look at this, if you would. It's in John, John, John chapter 6. We look at this later on. Have a read of it. Disciples, they're called. Followers of Jesus. But when they couldn't take his teaching, they turned and they went away. And then he said this to Peter. Will you also go? No, he didn't say it to Peter. He said it to his disciples. And then Peter answered. Where the Lord said, will you also go away? And Peter said to him, to whom else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to know and to believe that you are the Son of God. What a testimony. And faced with truth that was so hard to figure out, the bread of life, participating of and benefiting from receiving that bread and that blood, the symbolism of his death, his own person and his accomplishment struggling to understand that they could put it they could leave it for the time being because they knew that while they didn't understand these words still had such a profound effect on them one of our late elders used to say and interestingly 
Someone said it the other, the other week going out, that it's possible, well, from their experience, to receive great blessing from things they cannot understand. Sometimes the truth hits you, and you don't understand it, but it's blessed to you. And we can be in that position where the Lord says, in a historical context, we could maybe think spiritually, blessed are your eyes, for they see. Your ears, for they hear. Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's speaking to us. We've got to listen. Let's pray. Let's pray just now. Thank you, Lord, for this time, opportunity. May your word be blessed to all of us that we might be able to think about it and forgive us, Lord, and help us to understand properly where we misunderstand and to embrace your truth and to know and experience and feel the force of its power. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it's for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Bring us to know this, each one of us. And remember the YF, be with them tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing in conclusion from Psalm 126, Psalm 126, Scottish Psalter, four, page 419, Psalm 126. When Zion's bondage, God turned back as men that dreamed were we, then filled with laughter was our mouth, our tongue with melody. Let's sing this psalm, the theme of sowing, of course, comes in the words of the psalm as well. Let's sing 126. When Zion's bondage, God turned back. When Zion's bondage, God turned back, I said that he buried. Then filled with laughter was her mouth, her tongue with melody. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.